It is my great honor to welcome back Quentin Kidd to provide us with an analysis of the recent election. Quentin is the Dean of the College of Social Sciences, Professor of Political Science and Academic Director of the Watson Center for Public Policy at Christopher Newport University. Quentin, I'm gonna pass it over to you now. There is a lot to unpack from the November general election. We really appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, Sarah Jane. Um... And I, I have a presentation that, uh, that everyone can see and I'll just talk my way through it. And um, I would just say at the front end, if anyone has questions after all of this, after they, after they watch all of this, um, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm glad to answer any questions that I can. And if I can't answer them, then I'll just say I can't either. I don't know. <laughs> so let me just go. So I call this, um, the title of this, I, I call it a snapback election. Um, and the reason that I call it a snapback election is gonna be uh, pretty clear. Um, let me uh, make sure that I can, oh, I'm sorry, there it is. It's gonna be pretty clear in this context. Um, if you look at um, the, 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 uh, the uh, electoral margins, um, and I've got divided here on this slide, even year results since 2008, odd year results since 2009, um, I'll explain the context of a snapback election uh, uh, in the context of these results. So if you, if you first look at the even year results since 2008, um, I, I draw a line under the 2014 um, uh, U.S. Senate uh, race where Mark Warner sort of held on to a small one-point win. And you'll notice the 08, the, the two 2012 results um, and, the, and the 2014 results um, have a margin of plus eight Democratic to plus one Democratic. So the plus eight Democratic is Barack Obama's win um, in 2008 in Virginia, the first time a Democratic uh, presidential candidate carried Virginia in decades. Um, and then Obama comes back and wins um, Virginia again by four points in, um, in, uh, in 2012. Tim Kaine hold, uh, wins a six point win in 2012. Mark Warner holds on to a one point win over Ed Gillespie in 2014. Um, the average of that is a five point Democratic um, margin. The average margin of those wins is five points for uh, Democrats. And then I draw a line under that because the next federal election in Virginia is 2016 and Democrats win a six point race. That's Hillary Clinton's win over Donald Trump. And then in 2018 in the US Senate uh, race, um, Tim Kaine has a 16 point win, which is just a phenomenal you know, margin in Virginia. And then in 2020, Hillary Clinton comes back and beats Donald Trump in Virginia. I'm sorry, Joe Biden comes back and beats Donald Trump in Virginia by 10 points. And the average uh, uh, from, uh, of the Trump era Democratic wins in Virginia is 11%. Um, so it's a, the, the, the average Democratic margins pre-Trump era to post-Trump era go up six points um, to Democratic plus 11. If you look at the odd year results, these are the Virginia uh, elections. In 2009, Republicans, this is when Cree Deeds loses to Bob McDonald by 13 points. And then in 2013, Terry McAuliffe um, wins um, that, uh, the first, his first run, or second run for governor, I guess. He really lost in the Democratic primary in 2009. He comes back and runs again in 2013. And he um, beats Ken Cuccinelli by three points. And then if you draw a line under those, because uh, we have a 2016 emergence of Donald Trump on the scene. In 2017, um, Democrats have a nine point win in the governor's race. And in 2017, Democrats pick up 15 House of Delegate seats. In 2019, they come back and pick up six more House of Delegate seats, pick up two Senate seats. And um, in, 20, in 2019, because of those pickups, Democrats control the General Assembly for the first time since 1993. They also control the governor's mansion. They control the lieutenant governor's seat. They control the attorney general's seat. And so by the, by the end, if you will, of the Trump era, um, Democrats in Virginia are winning these massively high margin races, average of 11 points in federal races, and, and picking up, you know, 15 seats in 2017, six seats in 2019, two seats in 20. Uh, two Senate seats in 2019. Basically what I'm arguing is that there was sort of a Trumpflation bubble uh, that had emerged in Virginia 
post 2016. And that Trumpflation bubble at the federal level, we can pretty easily calculate it to be about 6%. Um, so Democratic win margins were, were elevated by about 6%, maybe 7%, um, uh, something like that. And on, and, and on the odd year results, the state results, Democratic margins, it's a little bit uh, more complicated to sort of calculate what the Trump bubble would be, but it's clearly um, elevated um, because Virginia is probably not a Democratic plus nine state in, 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 um, in state elections. And, and Democrats can't do the kind of things they did in 2017, 2019 in terms of House of Delegates to state Senate seats. And so essentially since 2016, there was this bubble, this Trumpflation bubble, and it burst in 2021. That's the, the, um, the, the argument that I'm making. Um, and I, and I'll, I also note that the worst climates for Democrats nationally on Virginia were 2009, 2014, and, 2000, and 2021. 2009 was the first election after the, um, after the uh, Barack Obama win. Um, really bad climate for Democrats. 2014 was the year uh, Democrats across the country were losing U.S. Senate races. Mark Warner held on by a slim margin of 1%, but it was a really bad climate. And Ed Gillespie, after that race, uh, said to me once that if he had had another week, he feels like he could have beaten Warner. Um, the, the, the polls were moving in his direction pretty rapidly. And then 2021. Um, so those are the three worst years during this this sort of post Barack Obama era in Virginia politics, the three worst years in terms of a larger national climate. And Democrats in those three worst years were able to hold on by one point in one of those years, and they lost pretty big in the other two years, 09 and uh, 21. Um, I'm trying to move my slide. All right. Um, Here's our, here's our polling um, of this governor's race. Um, as you all know, the Watson Center does uh, a significant amount of polling um, around elections. And we did basically three, what we call horse race polls. That is sort of polls where we, where we do a pretty tight likely voter model screen. And, um, and you know, we're just trying to interview the people who are, or who are gonna vote in the election. And what you can see in our polling is that Terry McAuliffe had hit a ceiling pretty early on. He probably had hit this ceiling um, uh, far earlier than when we released this in August 26. Of, of, we had him at 50% in August 26. We had Glenn Youngkin at 41%. Um, in, our, in our next horse race poll that we released on October 8th, Terry McAuliffe was at 49%. Glenn Youngkin was at 44%, so he was climbing. In our last horse race poll that we, re we released on the 27th of October, Terry McAuliffe was at 49%, Glenn Youngkin was at 48%. And if you follow those trend lines out on the far right-hand side there, I have a red and a blue dot that are, that are um, highlighted in black. Um, if you follow the trend lines out, you get to essentially what the um, election results were. Glenn Youngkin at around 51%, Terry McAuliffe essentially at 49%. And so it, it is clear uh, uh, if you follow the trend lines in our polling that McAuliffe had hit a ceiling um, and he was not able to break that ceiling. The ceiling was 49%, 40, uh, 49 to 50%. It, it actually dropped to 49 and stayed there in our polling and Yunkin was moving. So undecided voters from the time the, the sort of sprint to election day begins, which is sort of you know right after the beginning of September, um, Undecided voters were breaking consistently for Glenn Young, and they were um, they were essentially not attracted to Terry McAuliffe, and they sort of knew they weren't attracted to Terry McAuliffe from the get go. Um, and if you look at the the cross tabs of our last horse race poll, there were there were some signs in there that Republicans were really engaged and Democrats were really in trouble. Among those, uh, one of the screening questions we use um, to determine a likely voter, um, there are several ways that we do this, but among them is we ask how enthusiastic you are to, uh, to vote in the upcoming election, or if you've already voted, how enthusiastic were you to vote? And, um, and so we found Republicans to have a 15% advantage over Democrats in terms of very enthusiasm, saying they're very enthusiastic. Um, that 
uh, is almost unheard of in the last decade, decade and a half in Virginia. Democrats have all, have nearly always had the enthusiasm advantage in Virginia over Republicans, but this year Republicans had a 15 point enthusiasm advantage over Democrats. And a couple other indicators that, that uh, Youngkin was in a good position relative to uh, McAuliffe was um, for, uh, again, among the first times um, in a decade, decade and a half, a Republican was leading independent voters. Um, in this case, we had Youngkin at 5144 um, over McAuliffe in terms of independent voters. Um, that number looks really close to what the final exit poll number looked. Um, so clearly independent voters were moving toward Youngkin this entire time and, and away from um, McAuliffe or they weren't attracted to McAuliffe at all. And then, um, and then, um, for for the last decade, Democrats have done really well. We we divide our our regions into four. We divide the Commonwealth into four regions for our polling. Democrats, the way they, the way Democrats always win elections in Virginia, or the way they have been winning them, is they build a solid base in Hampton Roads, especially in the four core cities um, of Hampton Roads. They build this. Uh, uh, they add to that solid foundation in Richmond. And then they put up these big walls around that foundation out of Northern Virginia. Um, and what we showed is um, Youngkin leading in the Richmond Central Virginia region, 55 to 44 in our last poll. And that again, has not been the way things have gone uh, in the last decade. Democrats have always led in three of the four regions. Republicans always lead in South Southwest. And you see that lead um, consistent here. Um, and Democrats usually lead big in Northern Virginia. They lead sizably in Hampton Roads, and then they usually lead marginally in Richmond, Central Virginia. In, the, in this instance, we see Youngkin leading in Richmond, Central Virginia. And in fact, um, uh, Youngkin won this region on election day. So you could see sort of what was happening or what was coming in, in some of the polling. Um, this was an election um, that, that had a record breaking uh, voter turnout, uh, among the highest turnout in gubernatorial elections in decades um, as a percentage of voters, and then um, record fundraising and record spending, essentially, um, for, uh, uh, you know, historically record um, spending, not even uh, relative to anything. It was just a record, a record election for gubernatorial candidates and House of Delegates uh, candidates, and then re a relative recent record in terms of percentage turnout. Um, and you can see that um, uh, turnout uh, percentage uh, reflected in this uh, bar chart that also shows turnout since 2008. I think 2008 is sort of the modern era of Virginia politics. And so you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, since 2008, presidential turnout has been relatively consistent. It's wandered you know, within three or four uh, percentage points. Um, but you can see steady increases in gubernatorial turnout. Dem Democrats have benefited from that steady increase until this year. And then uh, Republicans benefited from that steady increase. And here's how they benefited from that steady increase. Um, this is a map um, that is color coded to show increases and decreases in percentage of vote relative to 2017. Um, and so if you look at the mustard yellow colors, the deeper mustard yellow is gonna be uh, uh, greater relative increases in uh, uh, relative to 2017. And the, the purple areas are gonna be greater decreases relative to 2017. And if you look at that map, and if you know anything about Virginia electoral politics, what you immediately see is that in Republican areas, um, the relative increase in turnout to 2017 was far greater and in Democratic areas, the relative decrease in turnout um, since 2017 was far greater. So Democratic um, turnout, even if there was record turnout overall, the record turnout was greater in Republican areas than it was in Democratic areas. Democrats actually did okay. They turned out about 150,000 more voters this year than they did four years ago. But Republicans turned out about 450,000 more voters um, this year than they did four years ago. And so you see the, the huge increase in turnout was largely driven by Republicans in Republican areas um, and not driven by Democrats in Democratic areas. 
Um, put another way, um, here's a, another map of Virginia, um, and the, uh, the the bubbles um, re are relative to the size of the locality. So obviously, you can see, you know, the largest bubble here is Fairfax County, and then you have, you know, large bubbles in Loud and Loudon and Prince William, large bubbles in Virginia Beach, for example, etc. But the um, the redness of the bubble is indicative of the increased Republican vote relative to 2017. And there is literally one blue dot on this entire uh, map, I think it's Emporia, and everything else is red. So in other words, in every locality that where it's measurable, vote increase was more Republican than Democratic um, in this election. Now, who, who, who are these voters? And 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 what was driving them? So, over the years at the Watson Center, we've done some uh, some studies of the Virginia electorate, and um, um, we we sort of have divided the Virginia's electorate into sort of seven groups. Um, four of those groups you can call the partisan warriors, and three of those groups you can call the less partisan middle. And so, um, among the partisan warriors, you have solid liberals, suburban liberals staunch conservatives and working class conservatives. And you can see the percentage of the overall electorate that is in each group. And then in the less partisan middle, you have libertarians, what are called disaffected voters. That's uh, among the most interesting groups in my mind. And then the less engaged moderates. Um, so where did these votes go? Where did these voters groups go in this election? And just as a, as a preface to this, I'll, I'll say, um, in the last decade or so that, that Democrats have been winning and winning big in Virginia, they've been winning big because they were, um, they had, uh, you know, huge uh, uh, volumes of votes out of their solid liberal base, out of their suburban liberal base. Um, and then the less engaged moderates um, were essentially siding with Democrats over Republicans. The less engaged moderates are sort of the, the independent vote um, of the electorate that sort of can swing either way and decide who wins. Um, Democrats have, al have also been doing okay among disaffected voters. Um, and disaffected voters are a group of, they're the, they're the group of voters that are least alike, but in the same group. And what I mean by that is disaffected voters are largely made up of, of um, black women in cities and rural white people. Um, and what brings them together as a political group is neither of them, neither of those two groups that, you know, the rural and the urban, um, feel that government has really uh, been effectively uh, uh, helpful to them. They don't feel like they have much of a voice in politics. They don't feel like they have much of a voice in, in what government does or doesn't do. And they don't feel like government has really ever done much to help them. And so they're disaffected from the electoral process because they don't see them voting as, as really being meaningful. Um, and so it's sometimes really hard to engage disaffected voters. Um, Republicans struggle in some ways because disaffected voters are spread around the rural parts of the state and it's hard to sort of reach out to any individual one of them or any individual group of them. And, uh, and for Democrats, disaffected voters are largely concentrated in the five core cities, but they, um, they're hard to reach. Um, and, and so they're hard to mobilize. Um, so what did these groups do in 21? Um, the solid liberals um, were hard to engage by Democrats this year. Um, solid liberals are made up of, uh, of people across the age spectrum, but they're basically, you know, the, the core liberals. I mean, they're not, they're not you know, gonna entertain voting Republican. They're not conservative in any way. They, they're, uh, they're, they're significantly younger, um, 44 and under. Um, and Democrats struggled to engage younger voters this year. In fact, some of the lowest relative turnout areas from 17 to 21 were in college towns, you know, Blacksburg and Charlottesville and places like that. Um, suburban liberals, they were engaged. Um, and if they voted, they voted Democratic, but they weren't very excited about Terry McAuliffe. Um, um, Terry McAuliffe didn't excite them. Um, and so they were just less energized. And I think this is where you get that big enthusiasm um, disadvantage for Democrats and advantage for Republicans. The suburban liberals that make up sort of, you know, the, the solid and suburban liberals that make up the core of the Democratic uh, base in Virginia weren't really that excited about the ticket that they had uh, to choose. Uh, staunch conservatives and working class conservatives, 
highly engaged, um, very excited. Glenn Youngkin um, um, uh, uh, was able to sort of energize them in a way that they haven't felt energized across their spectrum of far right to medium right um, in a long time. Uh, these the, the groups of, of staunch conservatives and working class conservatives love Donald Trump, but the more moderate ones of them were less excited about Donald Trump. Well, those more moderate ones were far more excited about Glenn Youngkin and the more conservative ones were more excited about, were as excited about Glenn Youngkin as they had been about Donald Trump. So among the partisan warrior groups, um, uh, Youngkin was able to keep both groups energized and excited. Democrats struggled to energize and excite their suburban uh, uh, liberals uh, and their uh, solid liberals. Among the less engaged middle of the electorate, libertarians weren't really engaged in this election. They didn't have a candidate on the ballot. Um, and, they, and they also tend to be a little bit younger. Younger voters just weren't that engaged in this election. And so libertarians really didn't play a role here. Um, disaffected voters, neither side really had an advantage among disaffected voters, but if anyone did have a little uh, an advantage, it would have been Republicans, just because of the extent to which uh, the Republican uh, partisan warriors were really engaged, that engagement would sort of bleed over into the disaffected rural uh, voter that that might otherwise not really be partisan, but they but they sort of felt the energy of of their more of their conservative neighbor who who had Yunkin signs up in their yard and things like that. Um, the uh, the disaffected Democratic likely Democratic voter or or possible Democratic voter in the core cities far less engaged, far less excited. Um, Democrats really had to work hard for them um, and didn't really. Uh, get get them to turn out like they needed them to. This is this is why, by the way, we had all the surrogates coming coming in for for uh, Democrats in the closing week and a half, two weeks of the election. Pharrell Williams, Stacey Abrams, you know, um, uh, Vice President Harris, and others. Uh, that was targeted at essentially engaging the suburban liberals and the suburbs, but also engaging the disaffected voters in the in the middle. Um, and then the last sort of group in the middle, the less engaged moderates. This is the group that, by the way, decided the election for Glenn Young. Less engaged moderates shifted in this election um, away from their, their habit of voting Democratic the last couple uh, four election cycles, and they, and they shifted to Youngkin. Um, even if in small numbers, it was meaningful numbers, because when you add the sort of huge turnout that, that, uh, that Republicans got out of their rural base, and then you had a slight shift in the less engaged moderates. Um, what you get is a is a two point uh, Glenn Youngkin win. So here's another way to look at this voter shift and to look at these groups. Um, if you look at the 2017 exit polls and compare them to the 2019 exit polls, and this is the um, the 2017 and 29 exit polls. I'm using the same exit polls. This is the uh, National um, national media uh, exit polls, not the um, not the uh, exit poll done by AP that was conducted by the University of Chicago, but this is the national election exit polls um, that are that are basically done by uh, the shared media poll. Um, turnout, uh, a Democratic share in Hampton Roads, for example, in 2017 was 61 percent. In 2021, it was 51 percent, a 10 percent difference. So while Democrats were able to actually increase voter turnout by about 150,000. Um, in again, remember how I said Democrats win elections in Virginia, they build solid, they build a solid base of votes out of Hampton Roads and Richmond, and then they build walls around that solid base in Northern Virginia. Well, the base was less solid this year for Democrats. Hampton Roads was a, uh, was a 10 point drop in its vote share for Democrats this year. Where did that 10% drop come from? those less engaged moderates that shifted from Democratic to Republican. Um, Northern Virginia's vote share was down 2%, 69% in 2017, 21% in 2021. That's a 2% 2 drop. 2% 2 doesn't sound like a lot, but in Northern Virginia where uh, a third to 40% to of all votes typically come from, it's a huge number. And what it meant is that wall around the less solid base was even less uh, tall than it normally is. Um, among female voters, um, there was a, an 8% drop, 61% uh, of the Democratic share in 2017, 53% in 2021. 
Again, this is that less engaged moderate shifting back from, from, uh, from Democratic voting to Republican voting. And then among younger voters, we see the drop. Um, this, is, this is that solid liberal base that Democrats had a hard time engaging in and exciting. 69% um, of the Democratic share in 2017 came from 18 to 29 year olds. That dropped to 53% this year, a 16% drop um, in, in, uh, in that, uh, um, that demographics vote share for Democrats. And then a less, um, less than 16, but, but still sizable, 12% drop among 30 to 44 year olds. Um, contrast that with, <clears throat> excuse me, the Republican vote share among white evangelicals went up by 10 points. So this is all of that increased vote that you see coming out of the rural part of Virginia. So we, everybody used to say white evangelicals were really engaged by Donald Trump. Well, Glenn Youngkin managed to engage them even more than Donald Trump had engaged them. He increased the margin out of white evangelicals by 10 points relative to 2017. And then black women increased their vote share to Republicans by six points from 8% of the vote share in 2017 to 21% of the vote share in 2021. And so Glenn Youngkin and Republicans were largely able to take 6% of the vote share uh, away from Democrats among black women. And so that's essentially in numerical terms, what you saw on those maps and what you saw in those voter groups, like what, what those voter groups did in terms of uh, this election relative to 2017. So what are the lessons here uh, for the two political parties? And, and I think Democrats have some perhaps more substantial lessons to learn than Republicans, but both parties I think have lessons to learn here. Um, for Democrats, I think among the most important lessons is that Virginia is not a deep blue state. Um, I think Democrats got a little bit sort of lost, lost track of, of, of sort of their, their, their compass a little bit in thinking that Democrat that, that Virginia was a deep blue democratic state, but it was really that Trumpflation that was driving the big margins that Democrats have been winning. And, it, and in fact, Democrats have to fight for Virginia voters as if they're in a purple battleground state. I still think at the end of the day, Virginia is probably a, a two, three, four point democratic state, but two, three, four points in a really bad election cycle um, where the climate is really horrible for you means a two point Republican win because you know uh, electorates swing four, five, six, seven points in any given election cycle. And so I think part of what Democrats have to learn is a little bit of hubris and a little bit, a little bit of laziness kills you um, in a really close election in a really bad environment for you. Um, secondly, and, you're, and I think you're hearing this among especially the more progressive um, side of the Democratic um, um, coalition in Virginia, it's not enough to just run against Donald Trump. Um, issues matter, and pe you know people need to hear what you what you're going to do and what you want to do. Um, I think people are tired of Donald Trump. I think both on the left and the right, people are tired of Donald Trump. And just because they voted um, Democratic in the last four years to send a message against Donald Trump doesn't mean that you're going to be able to scare them into doing that again when Donald Trump isn't in office. Um, Voters want to vote for something. Um, they don't want to vote against something. Um, and, and it may sound like they, that you know, in the last four years of Donald Trump, voters are voting against something. But really, I think Trump supporters were voting for something um, when they voted for Donald Trump. And if you'll remember, when, when, uh, um, uh, after both parties had had their uh, primary and their convention, Terry McAuliffe famously would say often, I have a plan for that. And he would say in response to something that Glenn Youngkin or the Republicans had said, where's his plan? Um, but instead, somewhere in the middle of the summer, the McAuliffe campaign seemed to shift to the sky is falling and it's all about Donald Trump. Um, and I think voters found that at the end of the day, uninspiring. Um, they wanted more. They saw, they, 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 it felt a little gimmicky sort of you know, um, sky is falling-ish. And I think voters wanted a little bit more than just, um, you know, this, the, the Trump, Trump, Trump. They wanted, they wanted to know what, young, uh, what McAuliffe was gonna do. And, um, and, and, and he sort of failed to provide that late in, the, late in his cycle or late in his run. Um, I think for Republicans, 
the lessons are obviously more on the upside. There's a way successfully to run um, as a Republican while keeping Trump at arm's length, but still keeping him at your side. You know, I can't imagine that every Republican either running for reelection or thinking about running for office isn't looking at Glenn Youngkin's campaign strategy and saying, OK, can I replicate some of parts of that? Um, I think Republicans, at least temporarily in Virginia, have figured out how to deal with their internal factions. Those internal factions have essentially kept moderates off the ticket and let and, and put uh, conservatives and, and on the ticket, conservatives that were too conservative for the Virginia electorate. Um, Republicans have figured out how to deal with that, at least temporarily. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, prior to the Republican convention, um, a lot of people were sort of scratching their heads and wondering how this ranked choice ballot thing would work for Republicans. And when only, what, 15, 17,000 Republicans participated, everyone said, well, there's no way that you're going to build any energy around that. Yeah, it looks like Republicans did, uh, were able to build energy around it because they were able to nominate out of that process, a candidate that was able to excite the electorate. Um, voters, at least in this election cycle, were more attracted to Republican issue framing than they were Democratic issue framing, in part because Democrats didn't seem to respond to issue framing much. Um, instead, it was more a Trump, Trump, Trump election. Um, um, I don't know that that's a long-term uh, lesson, but at least in this context, if Democrats are gonna run against Trump, Republicans can run on issues and it worked for them. Um, and despite all of this, and I think this is the sort of warning lesson for Republicans, despite all of this, Republicans were only able to win a two point uh, um, race. Um, and so this was probably the worst climate for Democrats since 2009. And, um, and they, they had an, a, a campaign that ultimately was uninspiring and Republicans were able to win a two point race I, it still says to me that, that that Virginia is a competitive purple state and both parties are going to have to work really hard to win um, voters. And then I think in general, um, a lesson uh, is that the larger political climate matters. Headwinds and tailwinds help in a, in, when, you're, when you're in a competitive purple state like this. And then um, from an electioneering perspective, um, we have a new... Uh, way of running elections in Virginia, and that is we have 45 days of unrestricted early voting. And what that means is that elections are going to be far more expensive than they ever have been. I think that's why we see the record kind of um, uh, campaign spending that we see. But it also means that campaigns have to turn to their get out the vote operations far earlier than they ever did. Um, and I know, you know, you, you, we all watch sort of local news and local TV. There were candidates on TV this year, six weeks out um, for running for House of Delegates. You, it, would, it would have been a strange uh, phenomenon two, four, six years ago to see a House of Delegates candidate on TV two or three weeks out. And this year we saw dozens and dozens around the state on six weeks out. Well, that's partly because of this 45 day, um, no excuse early voting. Um, campaigns had to shift to get out the vote operations early. And part of that is being on TV. Um, and I'll leave you with, um, with this photo. Um, Cause I think in some ways this photograph um, says it all. This is the day that Terry McAuliffe announced he was running for governor. Um, they're standing behind, uh, he's standing uh, in front of an elementary school. Um, he has, um, Three elected, uh, uh, four elected officials standing behind him, State Senator Louise Lucas, LeVar Stoney is there. Um, three black women on, the, on the, the signage on the front of his podium, our kids, our schools, our future. The irony is that I would argue Glenn Youngkin uh, beat Terry McAuliffe on the issue of education. Granted, there were bull, dog whistle bullhorns um, that were embedded in that, but ultimately, um, you know, Glenn Youngkin was able to seize on the issue of education in the way that he wanted to characterize it. Um, and um, the vote share for, uh, for Democrats among black women actually went down this year. And so I don't know where this Terry McAuliffe went. Um, this was the Terry McAuliffe that announced he was running for governor. Um, and somewhere in, in July, this Terry McAuliffe went away. And the Terry McAuliffe that emerged was a Terry McAuliffe that only wanted to talk about Donald Trump. 
And ultimately that's what voters I think weren't excited about. Um, and, and is partly the reason that, um, that, that McAuliffe uh, ended up on the losing side of the ledger and not the winning side of the ledger. Um, I know Democrats, uh, the McAuliffe campaign wants to say, the, the operatives in his campaign wanna say, it's all about the larger climate. It's all about you know, the, Republic, uh, the Democrats in Congress not being able to pass any of Biden's agenda. And there's a point to that. I mean, the larger climate was really bad for Democrats. But at the end of the day, Democrats had been winning um, races, um, 2014 is an example, in times of bad climate for Democrats. Um, and so there's no reason to think they couldn't have done it again this year in a state like Virginia, except that somehow this Terry McAuliffe um, disappeared and a Terry McAuliffe that only wanted to talk about Donald Trump reappeared or appeared and ultimately voters weren't uh, attracted to that. So I'll leave you with that image. And, um, and I said to Sarah Jane, um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me. I'm glad to you know, banter back and forth with you about them. Thank you. Quentin, thank you so much. That is absolutely fascinating. Uh, there's a lot of information in there for us all to uh, enjoy and uh, kind of uh, use as our, uh, I guess, uh, you know, we, we can spend some time talking with our families about it over Thanksgiving and uh, oh, doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> move into the future. That's right. So, uh, but we really do appreciate your time. I have to tell you, um, we're a big fan of you at, here at Civic and uh, we really appreciate you being such a good friend to us and uh, we're really fortunate to have you here in Virginia and uh, hope that you'll come back I guess the next thing is the midterm so we hope that you'll come back and unpack even more so uh, thank you so much sir and if you have questions don't forget you can reach out to our civic office and we'll put you in touch with Quentin so he can answer any other burning questions you might have thank you all so much